Good evening. Thank you for spending this beautiful August, August, autumn, aug, autumn, this autumn evening here with us at RS9. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, also introduce, in a few minutes, after I tell a few stories and warm you up, my dear friend Andrew Wright. So you get a, an American and a Brit. So if you need translation for either language, uh, ask the person next to you. So where to begin? Um, it's Friday night. And in the home that I grew up in, my mother, used to light the Sabbath candles. Now, I was a rambunctious kid, rambunctious. That's a big word for I was always jumping around. I never sat down. But when my mother would light the candles, I would sit there in rapt attention. And she had this beautiful shawl she put over her head she told me that it was her mother's, and her mother comes from this area here. Actually, 100 years ago, this year, my family left Kirayutsa to go to the USA and have a great life in New York City. I grew up in the Bronx, and um, if you can't translate my accent again, maybe somebody next to you can. Um, my mom would put this shawl on and liked candles, and each candle was high, low, and bigger, and smaller, and each one represented something. And she would move her hands in some cryptic way, and with her eyes closed, the tear would drip slowly down her freckled cheeks. And years later, when I had kids, and we were eating chicken soup in my mom's house, I said, Ma, what were you thinking about? All those Sabbath nights that you lit the candles and you made these movements. And she looked down at me and she said, Tatala, the Jewish mother calls the Jewish son Tatala. Tata is father. Tatala is little father. The daughter is called Mamala, little mother. She always called me Tatala. Tatala, I was thinking about all the people in our family who we loved from near and afar who have been and gone. And I keep the love and the memories of them in the light of the candles. And I think of all of the people that I love who, who are in Brazil and Los Angeles and Tel Aviv and on the kibbutz in the north. And I wish them the best. And of course, I wish the best to the next and future generations. My mom was a really wise woman. I also asked her, hey, Ma, you know, all my friends came to your house. You fed them, you gave them milk and juice, and they could sleep over. And most of those kids, I never even knew who their parents were. I never got a glass of water if I was in their house and waiting. And my mother would smile and pat me on the head. And she said, ah, for a few glasses of milk and juice and some sandwiches, I knew who your friends were and I knew where my sons were the wisdom of a mother. So my mom, she had a father, of course, my Zeta. He came from Matamore Siget. Any of you know where that might be? This is in old Hungary, yes? Anyone from Transylvania? Ah, always a few Transylvanians. When I was teaching in Hungarian colleges, it would take me from 10 to 15 minutes to figure out who the Transylvanians are in the, in the class. 25, 23 people, 15 minutes, two, two Transylvanians. If you want to know how I did that after the show, you can say hi and ask me. Let me tell you one of my Zeta favorite stories. I 
changed it a little bit. You see, he grew up in modern water Sigmund, in, in the Jewish shtetl of Transylvania, and I drew, grew up in the Bronx, right near Yankee Stadium. I was at the Woodstock Festival. So we have a little bit difference of our generations. What we did have in common was, of the 23 grandchildren in the family, I was the only one who spoke Yiddish. And Zeta, that was the only language he could speak, besides Hungarian and Slovakian and, and a little Polish and a little Russian. You know those guys who came to the immigrants. So, the story goes, there was a, a famous preacher. Now, a preacher is a word we can use. You know, I know my, my Muslim friends back in, in Haifa, they call their leaders the imam. My friends back in the Bronx who went to the Catholic school, he was the priest. My other friends, they call it the pastor, the priest, the pastor, the imam, the, the guru, the rabbi. So let's call it the preacher. And this story can be told from any, any view and any belief system. So this, of course, being my grandpa's story, it's about a great, the great preacher of Dubno. In those days, people traveled far and wide by horse and wagon. And one day, while the coachman of the preacher was riding those horses, and the great preacher was looking at all that he could take in, the clouds movement, the sun shining, birds, the sounds of the crickets and the frogs as he passed the lake. And the preacher noticed a strange look on the coachman's face. Dear coachman, I noticed that you have a, a pensive uh, expression. Uh, do you care to share um, what's on your mind? Uh, yes, dear preacher, I'm glad that you asked. You see, uh, all these years, these 10 full years that, that we've traveled together, uh, I've, I'm very happy to, to be your coachman. And every, every place we go to, every village and town we stop in, they treat you with such love and reverence. Their, their eyes are sparkling as they, as they look up on you. And, and I'm just a, a, a coachman. I would really like to experience that just once in my life. Hmm, said the preacher. What do you have in, in mind, my dear coachman? Well, <laughs> you know, the next town we're going to, to, we've never been there before. They don't know you and they don't know me. So if we change clothes and, and you drive the team of horses dressed as the coachman, they think I'm the preacher and you're the coachman and they'll treat me with this love and respect and, and I'll know how it feels. Huh, hmm, said the preacher. Huh, hmm. He was a good man and a wise man, but just like you or I, it's good to pull a practical joke sometimes. And he started to think, but, but, my dear coachman, of course they will, they will ask you to decipher some, some complex parts of the, of the Talmud, and, and what would you do then? Oh, <laughs> said the coachman, they ask the same questions in all the towns. I know the answers backwards and forwards. It would be easy for me. Hmm, said the preacher, pondering a little. Then he sees the white owl. It's a sign. And the preacher always believed that everything was a coincidence. Okay, let's do it. Pull over there behind those bushes. And they pull and, and they change clothes and the preacher dresses as the coachman and the coachman dresses as the preacher and he gets up on the horse and he starts now to drive the team of horses into the village where everybody is waiting. A red carpet is strewn down the middle of, of the street into a magnificent hall where a banquet is fit for a king. And the preacher walks down on the red carpet, takes his place at the end of the table, at the head of the table, with all of the, cap the town's dignitaries. And they eat and they drink the finest chicken that they just 
slaughtered the morning and wine from the grapes that they just stomped last week. And everyone is in all their glory and they're talking and they're so happy and the wise man of the town sits next to the preacher who's really the coachman dressed as the preacher. While the real preacher is leaning up against the back wall, really interested to see what's going to transpire. And they ask the fake preacher sitting at the head of the table, my dear preacher, we are so elated to have you come into our midst. Here is a question that for generations in our small, humble village has caused so much pain, so much hardship. Families have broken up. Marriages have gone the way of the, of the river. Please, can you put it to rest? Can you answer this complex, difficult question in the Talmud? straightens his spine, puts that I know everything expression on his face. And he looks down at the book. He couldn't even read. And the real preacher, now things are getting hot. He slams down on the table. What? You waste my time with such trivialities, with such nonsensical, simple-minded, uncomplex, easy passages in the Talmud. Why do I come here and travel so far for such a simple answer? It's so simple, even, even my coachman can answer it. Coachman, he answered that question. And you know, people in, up in those little villages in Transylvania, they don't forget. And to this day, they never speak about the wisdom in the visit of the great preacher. They speak still about the wisdom of his coachman. A man, like any other man, like you, like him, like that guy over there, like this guy over here, like that guy with the rings, the man with the white and black striped shirt, and of course, the man with the camera was walking down the road. Beautiful August day. The leaves were still on the trees. They hadn't yet turned yellow and orange and golden. And he noticed something to the left on the side of the road that caught his attention. He was a curious man. And he took a step over. And he noticed as he bent down that it was a large flat stone. Hmm. I wonder, said the man, what might be under the stone? Come on, haven't you wondered? And he bent down and he grabbed that stone and he lifted and he lifted and as soon as that stone was lifted a few inches, oh, centimeters, <laughs> out uncoiled a large venomous snake and the snake eyes bulge and say, Ma'am, I am a snake and I am going to kill you. S Whoa, said the man. Be reasonable. I have liberated you. S 
liberated me, said the snake. Your curiosity made you bend down and, and liberate me. Now that I have you in my control, I am going to kill you. Because to a snake, snake behavior is what's reasonable. Whoa, 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 said the man. Um, give me one more chance. Um, how about, l l l let's walk down the road together. And the next animal, being neither man nor snake, will adjudicate your fate, <laughs> my fate, your fate. <laughs> hmm, said the snake. Okay, we will go, we will proceed according to your plan and not mine. The next animal we meet, we will ask to adjudicate your fate, said the snake. And they walked down the road and they came upon a horse in the field. An old horse with a broken back and gray and, 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 oh, and the snake goes over to the horse and says, Mr. Horse, I am a snake. I have this man under my power and I would like to know what you think. What, you do if you had a man under your power. <laughs> said the horse. For all my life, I have pulled the horse's wagon, pulled his plow to make his plants grow. And now that I'm old and infirm, and I can't pull anything I can't carry, next week, the man will sell me <laughs> in the market for mutton, for dog food. If I had control of that man, said the horse, I would kill him. <laughs> whoa, whoa, said the man. Please, snake, snake, let's give me one more chance. Let's go down the road and ask the next animal, having no preconceived prejudice against man. Mm, okay, said the snake, one more chance. And they walk down the road. And they come upon a sheep tethered next to the stone wall near the road. And the snake goes, fellow sheep, this is the situation. Now you can judge. What do you think I should do with the, the man? Bah, bah, said the sheep. All my life I have been shorn of my wool and, and, and now that I give no more wool, it is no use tomorrow. They will chop me up for lamb chops and eat me. If I had control of the man, I would kill him. Whoa, and the man is crying. He's on his knees, tears are dripping down his face. Please, just one more chance, said the man. Okay, one more, and they proceed down the road. And there, sleeping on a sun. Sunny afternoon, there's a nice fox, Mr. Rocco himself, sleeping on that stone wall. Wait a minute, snake. And the man goes over. Hello, hello, brother fox. I am friend, I am man, friend of fox. And this is my situation. And only you and your wisdom and your altruism can, can save me from my fate with the snake. Whoa, said the fox, waking up. What's going on here? And the snake starts to tell the fox the story. And the fox says, whoa, 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 whoa. Hearsay will not do for me. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. And the snake, the man, and the fox proceed you know, back where they came from. And they see the old sheep in the field. Bah. And the old horse. And they come to the side of the road with the large flat stone. And the fox says, man, please lift the stone. And the man bends and lifts the stone. Snake, said the fox, take your place where the story began. And the snake coils back under the rock, and the man bam, and slams on that large, flat stone. 
And here, of course, is where the snake leaves our story here. Now the man is tripping with sweat, tears of joy. Come with me. And they walk down the road to the man's farmhouse. Please stay here, said the farmer, and I'm going to come back with some chickens. The farmer goes over to the chicken coop and brings a nice bag full of three chickens. He gives them to the fox, and the fox starts to open up the chicken. Whoa, 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 said the man. Please, please, please. You see out the window, across the field, Behind those trees, I don't want my neighbors thinking I'm friends of the fox, consorting with the fox. They will surely censure me and be angry at you. So why don't you go jump out the window and you will eat unmolested. Happy lunch. Go ahead. Hmm, said the fox, throwing the sack over his shoulder. Sounds reasonable to me. And he bounds out the window, across the field, and behind the trees. where the farmer knew the hunters were waiting for him. And here the fox leaves our story. But the man, his fate is yet to be told. Now that I've warmed up the space, I would like to invite Andrew Please. Thank you very much. If you have six, six to 12 hours uh, and you go to YouTube, just put in Andrew Wright. Six to 12 to 20 hours, whatever. Right. Please. I tried. Yeah. I should try it myself. I, I don't even know how to go to YouTube. Um, Jay, thank you very much for inviting me this evening. I'm realising that the stories you've chosen to, sh to tell us this evening really go very deep in our common wisdom that we've built up over the years. The stories that I want to read to you this evening are really very different indeed. I, I've been asked um, in six months' time in Manchester, to talk about stories and migration. I suppose the reason for that is that it's very topical, particularly in this country. Um, thinking about this idea of migration, why does it seem to be so important? And I was thinking about that at my desk, in the house, when I thought I needed a cup of coffee. So I walked along the corridor, and was passing my daughter's room, she's here now, uh, Alex, she has autism, and she called out from the room, elephants! <laughs> and I thought to myself, her mind, her ideas, what she thinks is important, her perceptions, her behaviour, are so different to mine. What does migration mean? Haven't I migrated, in this case in my own house, not going to another country, haven't I migrated to somebody else's world? Where, where, where she, in this case, values things so differently, sees them so differently. And then I considered and went down to the kitchen where my wife Julie was, and Julie loves cooking, but she's also very, very much of a businesswoman. And so she was cooking and using the telephone and organising, I, I can't remember what it was, but it was a whole team of Polish interpreters working at Procter & Gamble, 24 hours of the day for three months, 
and she was deep in the administration of that. I thought, wait a minute, this is another world that's not mine. So I have migrated in my own house. That's gone very deep with me. So now I'm asking myself, what is it about these differences between us? And when does it, when is it harmonious? When is it just compatible? And when is it a disaster? And so I've begun to think along those lines in my own life and in the lives of my friends I've been talking to. And if any of you are interested, please get in touch with me afterwards because I'd love to have your contribution. I'm now beginning to collect stories from friends, very often to do with migration, but very often to do with this other thing that I find in a way more interesting. The idea that we can be with our fellows, even in the same family, and have very, very different ways of looking at things. If I may, I'm going to read my stories. Those of you who have heard me tell stories before, <coughs> not used to that at all. I've called this one The Blitz, and in English, British English anyway, we adopted that word from German, and it refers to the war, the Second World War, and um, the bursts of light, I imagine, from the bombing which occurred gave us the word blitz. So this story is called, from my life, The Blitz and My Brother Stabbing Soldiers. I was four years old. It was the Blitz. The German planes were coming over to bomb Sheffield, my city a city producing steel for the war effort. The siren went, but my mother said, I'm not taking you into the shelter. It's chilly in there. Do you know the word chilly? It means rather cold and a little bit damp. It's chilly in there, and you've got a temperature. Let's see what it is. And she pulled the thermometer out of my mouth. Good heavens! It's 102. I'm certainly not taking you into the shelter. My mother took me, tucked me in and put another blanket on the bed. The lights in the house were off because the siren had gone. Every so often there was a flash of light as a bomb fell and the windows rattled. I'll make you something warm to drink. I was dizzy. I was only semi-conscious with the high temperature my flu and my tiredness. It was midnight or later. Another bomb fell much closer and several more. One of them hit a house just down the road. Most of the bombs were incendiary bombs designed to set everything on fire. More bombs. My mother brought my drink. My brother John came into the room to see me. My mother told him, Let's see if you'll go to sleep. So I pretended to be asleep, and I think that made me fall asleep. My mother came into the room a few hours later. There were more flashes, but perhaps less of them, I'm not sure. But I had a vivid image with my eyes wide open. I was sitting upright in bed, and I could see a German soldier crouching in the room. It was my imagination, do you call it? I said, there's a soldier. Where's the soldier? There, he's there. And he was vivid. I see him now as I write this, 80 years later. My mother called out, well actually it would be 78 years later to be a pedant. My mother called out, John, come and help. Andrew can see a soldier in the room. John came into the room carrying a Jacobean spear from the 17th century, bought by my grandfather. Where is he? There, he's there. 
John stabbed the wraith of the crouching soldier again, again and again. He's there, I said, pointing to a different place in the room. John went there and stabbed again. There, there, he's there. This was fun. I was beginning to enjoy it. My brother said, he's not serious. I'm not doing this anymore. It was good fun. I felt a bit better. <clears throat> There were less flashes, less shakings of the windows, and it was harder to hear that high engine throb of the German bombers. Dawn was coming. My mother laid me down again and tucked me in. She felt my forehead. He's getting better, thank goodness. John went to school in the morning. There were no trams running. He walked the five miles through burning houses in between piles of rubble and unexploded incendiary bombs. There was one teacher in the school who told him to go home again. So he did. So in my collection, I found myself going back to when I was four years old, in 1941. A few weeks ago, um, my big daughter, so um, Alex, who's at the back there, her sister, Timmy, um, she came back from Bosnia and she had lots of stories to tell me. So this is, this is her story as she told it to me and I feel it belongs to this collection of seeing things and valuing them and then behaving towards them very differently. So this is Timmy speaking. I've called the story The Snake. He was laughing, laughing loudly and harshly. He was thrashing the snake to pieces on the granite rock. He was holding it by the tail and he was whipping it on the rock and instantly circling it up again to whip it again until the little of its body was left. And I ran towards him. I screamed at him. Stop that, you bastard, stop that. No problem, he laughed at me and chucked the last piece of the snake into the bushes. And he walked off, still laughing. Bastard, murderer. He laughed, but didn't turn around. I looked at the surface of the rock, glistening with the moisture of the snake's beaten body. The children with the man came up to me. One of them, a boy, said, crazy. I didn't know what he meant, me or the man. Who is crazy? Our mother's brother, he's crazy. Yes, he murdered the snake, he killed the snake. The snake did not attack him. Snake's very dangerous, said the boy. Dead snake, good. No dead snake, no good. The boy was about ten. He spoke as a senior child in the group. Good kill snake. Bible. Snake give apple to Adam. Kill snake for God. Nature is my God. And the snake is part of nature. He killed part of my God. But we are in Bosnia, not your country. He wasn't laughing. He wasn't reveling in the killing. He was explaining his point of view. I touched his forearm. I smiled. And Bosnia is a lovely country, I told him. And it is. Thank you. A few years after the Bosnian Wars ended, I worked there in a whew, in a reintegration language and arts program with the Serbian Orthodox teenagers, the Croat Catholic, and the Bosniak Muslim teenagers. And 
would I always hear in my mind, most mornings in the summer, first you hear, Then you hear roo, 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 roo. the dog barks at the rooster crowing. Then you hear Alakba. Then you hear bong, bong, bong of the church. It's great in Boston. Peace, brother. As a kid growing up in New York and Canada, also in the US and Canada, we grow up with a story called the giving tree. And the giving tree is um, an old tale Turk taken from the, the ancient books and the stories. And it's about a tree that has a relation with a little boy. And through the life of the boy as he grows older, different generations, he returns to the tree. But that is a classical tale, and when I asked for the rights to use the story about the tree, they told me, no way, no how, don't even try it. We will find you, we will hang you, we will get you. So, no tree, sorry, here goes. High in the mountain, Near a great city, there lived a pond. And every day in the summer when it was oh so very hot, the little boy would come. And he'd swim in the water and splash. And play games. The boy loved the pond so very much, and the pond was happy. But the boy stayed away, and the pond was sad and lonely. Boy, boy, come, swim in my water, and splash, and let's play games. Oh, I'm sorry, said the boy. I'm a teenager now, pond, and I need money. Can you give me some money to buy things like the other kids have? I'm sorry, but I don't use money, but what I have at the depths of my waters are fish. And if you catch them, you can sell them in the market. And the boy spent all of that day and half of the next catching those fish. Woo! He caught the biggest fish. He caught teeny weeny fish. And he went to the market and sold them for money and bought the things that teenagers need. And the boy loved the pond so very much. And the pond was happy. But the boy stayed away for a longer while. <laughs> boy, come, swim in my water and splash and let's play games. Oh, I'm sorry, Pom, my friend, but I have a beautiful wife and two small children, but Pom, we don't have a house. Can you give us a house? The mountain and the forest is my home, but what I do have at the depths of my waters are shells and within are precious pearls. And the boy swam to the depths of the pond and he collected all of the shells. He took them to the market and he... He built a big beautiful house like you or you live in. And the boy loved the pond 
so very much. And the pond was happy. But the winter came, and the pond froze from the cold and the lack of love. But as you know, as you all know, the seasons change. They come and go, and the sun, and the spring, and the boy, boy, come, swim in my waters, and splash, and let's play games. Oh, <laughs> said the boy, I am retired from my work, and I just want to travel the earth and meet the different peoples of the world. Can you please help me to travel pond? All I have left to give you is my water. And the boy took some pipes and he sunk them to the depths of the pond. And he turned on the great faucet and the water went up into the pipes under the road, across the valley, to all of our homes in the city, to use our water. And the boy loved the pond, and the pond was happy. Years passed, and the boy returned. Pond? Pond, my dear friend, please, Pond, give me a sign. I have not the eyes of my youth to find you, Pond. Now we know from the story that the Pond, she really loved the boy. But there's a time when you love someone so much you must be honest with them. And the palm said, boy, when you came to me as a teenager, I gave you my fish, and there are no more. As a young man, you needed a house for your family. I gave you my precious pearls. There is not one left. You wanted to travel and meet the peoples of the earth. I gave you my water. And now I am nothing but a dried up mud puddle. And the boy heard this <laughs> and he began to cry. And his tears falling into the mud puddle, he saw that it started to rise. And just as the water reached his knees, the clouds covered up the sky. Can everybody put your hands together and make a fist, both hands? Take a deep breath through your nose and and the clouds opened up and poured down upon the boy standing in the pond and he saw that the water was rising and rising. And again, put your fingers together. Take a deep breath again. This is the yoga part of the show. <laughs> and, and the sun broke through the clouds. And when the boy looked down upon the water, he saw his face, his reflection upon the surface. And after all of these years, after a lifetime, the boy loved the pond so very much. And the pond was to do some improvisation with you, and I'll be the fool. 
All right, so let me take you to the park. Okay, I'm in the park. And what kind of characters? We see some kind of archetypes, some characters in the park. Yeah, there's birds in the park. And, and what else? Let, let, give me some ideas and, and I'll play along with your ideas. Now this is a chance to get me back. Cats. Huh? Cats. A, a cat? Yeah. A cat in the park. And who does the cat meet? The dog, an asphalt pigeon. The, 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 an asphalt pigeon. The asphalt pigeon? Asshole. Rude, not nice. Oh, oh, ba oh the uh, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> You're from the Bronx? <laughs> um, This is Jay. Richard, this is L.A. I'm talking L.A. I'm right in the middle of a show in Budapest on Friday night. It's 8.30. <laughs> you, hear my, you hear the audience? He says, Richard says hi. And uh, could you call me in an hour? <laughs> huh? Okay, bye. <laughs> This is great, that's why I picked it up. So, when you get to my age, your cousins die. <laughs> right, and um, so, um, a few months ago, my cousin, who was a very, my cousin, right? My lawyer, 15 years ago here, Chaba, he knew my cousin, because my cousin, writes law textbooks. So he knew my cousin because my cousin wrote the first law textbook on cyberspace law. It was called Beyond Our Control, right? So my, my lawyer knows him. Then I, I was manager and director of a summer camp in the Balaton with those kids from Bosnia and so on. And the people who came from America to be the counselors also, they knew my cousin because they were from San Francisco, and he worked in San Francisco as a teacher to desegregate the San Francisco public schools. Because you see, the Chinese in that district were the majority, and they didn't want other people to come into their school. So that's two people that knew him. Then I start my first day of school in 1997 in Britannica International School, well, we had 36 kids then, now there's 700. But, first day of school, they were introduced to the staff. Uh, Yuri says, Mike, this is Jay. Jay, this is Mike. You're the two Americans. Hi, Mike, where are you from? California, I'm from New York. Did, what school did you go to, Mike? UCLA. Ah, you know my cousin Stu? Yeah. He was my mentor. Three people knew my cousin Stu. So, Stu died. And it was terrible for me. He really was very close to me intellectually and my cousin. But then, months after he dies, his telephone, this number, calls me. He's dead, but his telephone calls me. So it was his friend, Richard. So he has things, books for me, and a oh, sweater for me, and, and stuff. Okay, uh, where were we were the cat and the bird. Right, the cat was a bird and a cat. Um, okay, um, come here, you, you've got the great shirt, right? So, you want to be the bird or the cat? Cat. Oh, oh, the cat and the bird, okay. Okay, let's see the cat. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. Getting back to Andrew's topic of immigration and emigration, to imagine my family in 1921 from Kirayutsa went to New York. From Kirayutsa, right here. Can I just, as a, with hands, I could see pretty good. How many people were not born in Hungary in the audience? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six. How many's parents, one of your parents weren't born in Hungary? To add to that. And grandparents. See? So we're all immigrated sometimes, somewhere. Um, you have a theme in mind? Maybe I know a story. Have an idea, a theme that's been on your mind? Hmm? Vampires. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have all those vampires. There was only one vampire when I grew up. That was Bela Lugosi. You could tell Bela Lugosi, Bela Lugosi. He was the only vampire. So, you know, we just didn't have so many vampires. Like you guys, have, I'm not a vampire guy. I'm not, I'm not a science fiction guy. I'm a, you know, murder mysteries. I'm the young guy. Um, all right. Then... I used to have a routine where I had all these papers and I'd drop all the papers. <laughs> now it's hard to get to bed now to get the papers. Um, okay, I see that I, my, my friend Gabor and Juji's children are here, so I'm gonna tell the story. Benjo, how old are you now? Han Avesh, how old are you? Quantos años tiene? Ten, ah, oh, this is a story about a ten-year-old kid. All right? Once upon a time, long, long ago, but very near to here, there lived a great king. And he was powerful. He was a pretty nice guy, too, which you don't see with kings. Kings used to be powerful and that, you know, but he was a good guy. And you know, the king had everything. He had a castle, he had horses, he had... No, there was no big screen TV or phones, or no. But he had everything they had in those days. Except one thing. What's a king without a queen? So they looked far and wide. They blew the trumpets looking for the queen, for the king. And all these women came and... and he wasn't happy. And of course, one day, one afternoon, he went out the back door of the castle, walking around, and he saw, wow, this very nice woman. She had long, dark hair down to her waist. Her eyes were so deep and dark, they almost looked black. The sun was shining through the trees and made her eyes twinkle. And oh, do, 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 the king fell in love with her. And to make a long story shorter, they got married and there was a great feast and all the people in the land came. There were thousands of people. They ate and ate and drank. And after nine, ten months, Queen had a beautiful baby girl. Now, the king loved that baby girl, and the queen was so happy to be a mother, but, you know, the king wants a son. And to make, it's getting late, it's Friday night, you work all day, and you want to go home. But one, then a second daughter, and a third daughter. Is there a word for a Hungarian mother who has three daughters? There is, right? Isn't there a one word that... No? No. No. Not yet? <laughs> well, here's the king, the macho king, with three daughters. And finally on the fourth, 
I'll let, let you go early. Finally, on the fourth, he has a beautiful son, the young prince. Ah, oh, now the king gets him with one of those little Shetland ponies. Shetland? Where was that place that you come? Sheffield. Oh, that's not Shetland. Sheffield. Shetland pony, and the little prince is riding that, jumping over little bumps and, and having a great time, and the little prince is learning how to use a, a bow and an arrow off the back of that horse, and using a little wooden sword, and the prince starts to grow and grow and grow. And as, like, I know you people want to give to your children, the king wanted to give everything to the little prince. And the prince had everything but one. One elusive thing that he practiced. He tried. Every time he pulled back his bow and let his arrow fly, he wanted to hit the bullseye. <laughs> Don't we all? Now, the king brought the Mongol warriors who can shoot from the back of a horse the eye of an eagle. The Swiss crossbowmen who could shoot the apple. Well, you know that story. Everything, everyone, every way, but this prince could not fulfill this elusive wish to hit the bullseye every time. So when it came time, he borrowed the wagon from the preacher from the last story. They got in the coach. See you, preacher. No, we don't need you. Everything's cool. And they started to look far and wide through valley and mountain, through village and dale. What's a dale? Anyway, everywhere to find the answer to how to hit the bullseye every time he lets his arrow fly. And one day, as they were entering a small, little village somewhere in Matamoto Siget neighborhood. There, on the side of an old, red, dilapidated, unpainted, broken barn, are six targets. And in the center of each is an arrow. Oh, stop, said the prince. Wait, whoa. And they waited. And along comes an old fellow. Look who's talking about old fellows. And the prince jumps down off the back. My dear fellow. Now the dear fellow noticed that that was the prince, son of the king, the most respected and fair king. Yes, my dear prince, what can I do for you? Well, um, uh, who uh, shot these arrows into the bullseyes? I, I would like you please to bring that person to me and whatever you wish, of course, will be yours. Oh, sure, said the old fellow, and he walks back towards the town and comes a few minutes later with a little 10-year-old kid. Right, 10-year-old kid was shaved, his hair on the left side, and it was long on the right side, and he had kind of like little mud on his face with a big smile, big brown eyes and long eyelashes, and he had his feet and pants were up to here, cut at the bottom, no shoes, smiling all the way, and the prince goes, you? You did that? Yeah, it was easy. Easy? If you teach me how to do this, anything your imagination can conjure up will be yours. All right. I'll show you. So, this little 10-year-old kid goes into the barn. And he takes his arrows, his bow. He says, look, this is what I do. See, I put my first arrow in the bow, and I pull it back really with all my strength, because I'm little, and I let it fly. And then my next, they let it fly. And my all six. And when I've shot all my arrows into the side of the barn, I go back and I get 
my bucket of paint and my paintbrush, and I paint the targets around the arrows. See? It's easy. <laughs> I only have a few minutes left on stage, and I would like to tell you, before you leave, one of my favorite stories. And I noticed wherever I work, in Bosnia, in Serbia, in, in Canada, everybody knows the story of Little Red Riding Hood, right? Uh, but I only have two minutes, so please listen carefully. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Little Red Riding Hood. She lived in the house in the, in the woods with her mother and brother and sister. One day, the telephone rang with grandma. She wasn't feeling good. She told the mother. Mother said, uh, I'm going to make some chicken soup. Little Red, will you take the chicken soup over the grandma's side? Little Red said, I'd love to take the chicken soup over the grandma's side. And she put on her Little Red Riding Hood and she took the chicken and she jollied and went through the forest. Now, the, you know the old story, the, the, the wolf jumped into grandma, threw grandma in the closet, and put on grandma's nightie, and... Little Red got to Grandma's house. She opened up the door. She put the <laughs> she put the soup on the stove. She opened up the bedroom door, and she knew that was the wolf. She knew that was not Grandma. Come on, really? Smelled like the wolf. Looked like the wolf. And and Little Red goes up to the wolf and says, "Grandma, dear Grandma, are you okay?" And when the wolf went, "Rah!" You see now. Little Red was no fool. She was practicing Taekwondo. She shook up that wolf so bad, he jumped out of bed, took off Grandma's mighty, threw it down, and she jumped out of, the, out of the window, through the field, up into the woods, and threw into the cave, into the den, and the werewolf said, yo, big bad, what happened to you? Well, you see, I was down, down in the valley, you know, messing with Little Red and Grandma, you know, like in the old story. Well, the Little Red, and she knew some, and she, me. and then now, you know, when I was thinking on the way here, maybe we should be nice to the women and respect them and, and be, be kinder. Yeah, we should. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Andrew, thanks so much. Um, please um, keep an eye out for RS Keelance Punku website. There's some really great, they have three different stages. I know some of you went across the street, but uh, keep in touch with us, and I'll see you at my next show, probably in January. If you're, anybody is gonna be in Los Angeles at the end of the month, beginning of November, I'll see you there. Thanks. Ten, huh? <laughs> Go ahead, <Dana. laughs>